Well, hello and welcome to another Tyrold Classic Workshop. Uh, it seems like at the moment these videos are like buses or policemen. Um, there's quite, not a lot for quite a while and then two arrive at once. Uh, we had the workshop catch up a week ago and now we're uh, back in business. Um, I don't know, we've got, uh, we're beginning to develop a backlog. We've got the uh, how to start your classic car video coming up and also part two of the Ferruccio Lamborghini Ferrari. And they are on the way, but these things don't make themselves. They sometimes take quite a bit of effort and timing and all that good stuff. But today we're focusing on a car that's in a way quite close to my heart, really. And that's the Rolls-Royce Camargue. My relationship with the Rolls-Royce at Factory Crew started in the late 70s, early 80s, when I was a teenager. At the age of 19, I got invited to go and start working as a mechanic at the local Rolls-Royce and Bentley service centre workshop. And uh, I learnt, I worked on virtually nothing but Rolls-Royce and Bentley cars at that time, silver clouds, silver shadows, things like that. And um, I learnt quite a lot about them, obviously, over the time I was there. But one of the cars that was launched in the mid 70s was the Camargue, this car. And it has a very interesting history as to how it came about. And it is a very interesting car. And it's what I would describe as a Marmite car. You either like it or you don't like it at all. Um, and a lot of people fall into the latter category. Uh, me, styling wise, I mean, I'm talking about the styling, um, for many years didn't really like the Camargue, but I think it's coming of age now. And even the most kitsch or off beam 70s chic is coming into a sort of genre of its own at the risk of using a lot of cliches and unusual words. But this car had a very interesting start to its life. As I say, I know this firsthand, so I'm pretty sure this is as true as it gets. Because as I say, I knew a lot of people at the factory at that time, a lot of people in senior management, Ian Rimmer, head of quality, uh, David Preston in the sales, etc. Mike Dunn, engineering, all these people, um, I sort of got to know really and it, it gave me a sort of inside track as to what was happening at Crew. a lot of unpublished things and a lot of dare I say it, secret projects that were going on but this one Project DY as it was called was inspired by David Plasto the very dynamic managing director of Rolls-Royce motor cars as it was called then which was of course was Bentley as well both based at the factory at Crew. Um, he was in his office and somebody visited the factory and his office overlooked a quadrangle, which was there then, I'm not sure it still is, a sort of square office block with a lawn in the middle and parking spaces. And the Rolls-Royce were thinking about a different model from the Corniche, a very exclusive and expensive model, but for the owner driver, not to be chauffeur driven in. A sort of, uh, like Ford Thunderbird did in the 1950s, the personal car, if you will. So David Plasto was in his office one day and he happened to look out the window and what was parked in the quadrangle was a fairly new at that time Fiat 130 Coupe. Uh, now this is where it gets a bit bizarre because who could have thought a Fiat inspired a Rolls Royce? But that's exactly what happened. The Fiat 130 Coupe, the saloon was a bit of a disaster really styling wise, the Fiat 130 saloon. But the 130 Coupe was as different as it could possibly be and it was styled by Paolo Martin at Pinaferina, the chief stylist at the time. And he came up with the 130 Coupe in 1971, I think. And it was an absolutely magnificent looking car. It was about as elegant as a, a large, roomy two-door coupe could be. Every line was just beautifully executed. And in fact, the 130 Coupe is a favourite of mine. I've, I've actually had four of them. I had my first one shortly after I was working at the Rolls-Royce uh, garage. But um, it always struck me that the styling similarities between the Camargue and the 130 Coupe, and there is a very good reason for that. So David Plasto is in his office. He looks down and sees the Fiat 130 Coupe, makes inquiries as to who's arrived in this car. He goes down and has a look at it himself and thinks, wow, I want the Rolls-Royce personal car, this super expensive owner-driver Rolls-Royce, to look like that. That's exactly the blueprint I have in mind. Cut a long story short, Sergio Pinaferina was approached, Paolo Martin was consulted, and Paolo Martin actually drew up styling exercises for Project DY, the Camargue. Um, 
and the similarities. The outside is, there are some similarities between this and the Fiat 130 Coupe. This sort of trough here running underneath the, uh, the door is, is a particular styling cue. Just the, uh, the cant rail line here. Um, but the most striking thing is the interior on the Camargue, styling wise, is almost 100% carbon copy of the Fiat 130 Coupe. It's difficult to conceive that the most expensive car in the world, as this was, could actually ape so closely a Fiat. But that is the reality of the situation. Now, the 130 Coupe was no ordinary Fiat. It was actually a very expensive car when it was new, significantly more than a Jaguar XJ12 or something like that. It was Fiat's absolute flagship and a great car. I really like the Fiat 130 Coupes, but that's for another day. We do happen to have a 130 Coupe here, and through the wonders of whizzy editing, so no pressure, Jonathan, we're going to show you the similarities between the interior on the Fiat 130 Coupe and the Camargue. They are strikingly similar. Even the sewing pattern on the seats is the same. But get back to the Camargue. It was announced in 1975. Um, I never particularly liked it as a new car, but it was frighteningly expensive. Um, in fact, it was the most expensive production car, and I use the term production advisedly because they only made 530 of them over a 10-year period. So less than one a week, really. And I've got this motor show guide. This is the, uh, the Daily Express motor show review, which as you can see is a little battle scarred. It's been around for some years, since 1975 to be precise. But here it is, the Rolls-Royce Camargue, Rolls-Royce Silver Shadow, which was a magnificent dollar earner and pound earner for Rolls-Royce. They sold every shadow they could make. In fact, when these cars were being built around 1975, there was a year to 18 month waiting list for a shadow. Uh, they were that popular. It was £16,554. The Rolls-Royce Phantom 6 started at 18000 and this was um, supposedly Rolls-Royce's top of the range. Then, boom, the Camargue arrives, £31,590. So it's almost twice the price of the Rolls-Royce Silver Shadow. And uh, this made it very, very, very exclusive indeed. And it's one of those cars that sort of passed me by for a number of years, but having spoken to people, there are one or two things about the Camargue that they got wrong from the start. Uh, Rolls-Royce, the Rolls-Royce development engineers would not consider alloy wheels in the 1970s at all. They stuck to the black painted pressed steel wheel. And this really sort of let the styling down. And if you look, the wheels on the Camargue, in fact, these are later alloys. So um, this is nowhere near as bad as the production cars. They were quite inset into the wheel arches, particularly at the back. And the result was the car always looked a bit lollopy and bulky because it had these wheels inset um, into, the, uh, into the, the car. And the other thing was they got something wrong right from the start on the back suspension. And quite often a car's stance makes all the difference to how the car looks. If it sits well on its four corners, it really can make or break a car. And the Camargue, they got the specification wrong for the back springs on the back suspension right from the word go. And although it has got self-leveling rear suspension to take up the clearance, they actually set the specification for that incorrectly as well. So the back always rode too low on the Camargue, which again made them look just wrong. Um, so the back end was always like this. It was only till later on in production, past 1980, that they decided eventually they could start putting alloy wheels on them when the Bentley Turbo R came out and that improved the look and they also sorted the back suspension and gave it just about an inch extra ride height at the back. Makes the world of difference to the car's stance. It's these small styling tricks that really, really make the difference. And one of the rules of thumb I've always used for how a car is standing is this, this bright strip here along the sill is normally a reference point. That's where the floor pan, if you like, meets the rest of the body. And if you extend this line through here, it roughly touches the top of that wheel center cap there. And if they've got it right, it should be the same as the back as well. If you look at how a lot of cars sit, that low belt line 
is an indicator of how well the car is sitting. But the Camargue, one of the aspects I do love about it is the dashboard. When Paolo Martin designed the dashboard, if, if indeed that was in his brief as well, he styled it on an aircraft cockpit dashboard. And I think it's one of the most wonderful car dashboards that's ever been conceived. I just love the styling of it. It's fantastic. Another thing they did was this radiator grill, the famous Rolls-Royce Palladian radiator grill, they angled it forward to make the car more aggressive, uh, rather like Lady Penelope's Rolls-Royce out of the original Thunderbird series. And Rolls-Royce, as ever, this grill is hand-built from nine plates of 304 stainless steel, and each plate is soldered on the inside on this mitered edge here. Um, and they, this particular line here looks straight, but it isn't. What they did was use a process invented by the Greeks when they were building the Parthenon called entasis, which means that if you want a line to look dead, dead straight to the naked eye, you make it slightly curved, it has the opposite effect. So this is not a straight line, this line down the grill here. Looks it, if they did make it straight, it would look curved, and if they did make it slightly curved as they did, it fools the eye into thinking it's plumb straight. Really clever bit of styling. The Camargue, they ended up making over a 10, 11 year period, just over 500 of them, as I say, roughly 10%, 15, 20% maximum of those would be right-hand drive. The Middle East was a huge market for this car. Sheikhs and uh, crown princes and whoever else absolutely took these in droves. And it, it was the first Rolls-Royce product to have the split level air conditioning system, as it was called. So you could have cool air to your face and warm air to your tootsies. All wonderful. At the same time and in the right order. Um, so, yeah, great bit of British motoring history with these alloy wheels on and with the rear ride height tweaked. I happen to like these now, styling-wise. I'll never love them, but I like them. And I think it's a fascinating piece of British and Italian motoring history. The other shock about the Camargue is um, it handles. Difficult to believe of a car so big, but in the 1980s, I was the agent for a handling kit which transformed Rolls-Royce and Bentley cars, the Harvey Bailey handling kit with springs, um, different anti-roll bars. Roddy Harvey Bailey was a very clever suspension engineer who did subcontract work for Aston Martin and all sorts of people. And he developed a handling kit for them. I sold quite a lot of them and fitted quite a lot of them. And they transformed the cars. And I can tell you, one of these on with those handling kits actually handles better than a silver shadow with the same kit on, even though the shadow is a smaller car. This is a big car. Why? Because a lot of the centre of gravity, the weight, is low down. They kept everything within the floor pan that they could. And we're going to take this car out on the road and give it a run and just uh, savour some of that Camargue experience. Don't forget this was a frighteningly expensive car, new. And I'm also going to be meeting a friend of mine who uh, was involved with these cars at the time. So let's, let's move on and let's, let's, meet my, uh, let's meet my pal now. Well, um, not only are we looking at uh, a very prestigious car, but I have a special guest star with me, and that is my pal Pete Aston, um, who, is it 30 years we've known each other? Oh, Neil? it probably is, Ian, yes. Hi. Um, hello. Lovely to be here. <laughs> um, and Pete, for his sins, was, um, you, well, you were... You didn't start off as that, but you were production director at Rolls-Royce and Bentley Cars was, and Crew. Yes, yes, And yes. you um, were responsible for making the last of these, weren't you, the Camargues? Yes, I was. Um, <laughs> Obviously, a, it, a lot of it was, was very, very special. I mean, I, I didn't used to like them at all, but um, <laughs> I, I think they've grown on me uh, because they actually drive shockingly well, mm. really and I'll take the one we got here out for a drive shortly. But I think time's been kind to them, really, in a way. I think their day is sort of coming. They've been so unloved for so long, and, and I'm asking the wrong person here, because <laughs> you, you have the task of, of turning yeah. the tw last 12 body shells into cars, I understand that, yeah. which it must have been a terrible uphill struggle, actually. Finding door they, handles they and were, things. They were just, every, everything about them. I, I mean, the kinds of things we used to do was you, we'd raid, raid the, first of all, you'd start with the guy, 
who fitted door handles back five years ago? And you'd go to him because he was now over in another part of the factory. You've got any door handles? Well, funnily enough, I have got a couple in my drawer. Would you like them? And then you'd go to the parts department. You know, what's your call on Camargue door handles? Well, we've got a couple in the box if you'd like them, right? Now, where do I get the other 10 sets from? And who made them? And, and so this notion that, well, if you've got the sets of bits and you've only got to put them together and this will leach this amount of profit... We were eating this profit away in in great <laughs> mouthfuls every minute because you then go to whoever made the door handles, Fratterini's or whatever, um, will you make us three or four sets of Camargue door handles? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> shall I tell you how much that's going to cost you? Um, well, we paid this for them when we bought them last time, 12 years ago. Yeah, yeah, but things have moved. So it was all of this kind of... I, th I think most people will... Most people that were deeply involved in it would probably say we should never have tried to put the cars together, but that's a personal point of view. Yeah. Um, but put them together, uh, you but did. I, we, but we did put them together. Um, there was one guy particularly assigned to build these cars and lovingly look after them. Uh, but back to your point, I, I think maybe they have... Certainly, I think they stand comparison with their peer group today in a, in a, in a very different way than they did at the time. I mean the value of them even now is unremarkable, isn't it? Mm. I, it I, is, I, I, yeah. You know, considering what they were. Yes. Um, but I think, as happens with small volume cars, um, somebody out there, somebody, somebody out there um, uh, falls in love with these things and then you own, you know, this is your, this is your business, isn't it? You only want one or two or three people to start fighting over a car. And all of a sudden, um, I was reading somewhere, one of the, um, there's a cabriolet, I think, isn't there, that we'd built one, just one cabriolet Camargo gather. And I understand. I didn't know that. And understand mm. that went for um, $200,000, for instance. And then somewhere out there, I don't know whether you've picked this up in your research, there's, um, there's a Bentley Camargo. Um, I think we built that car prior to my time, but I think that was built for Dick Perry, who was chief exec of uh, Rolls-Royce and Bentley in the early 80s. I remember Dick Perry, yeah. yes. Yes, he, <laughs> yes, he was an interesting character. He was an interesting character. Now, just to talk, to move on to Serif and Arnage, which mm -hmm. obviously we're trying to condense many hours of conversations <laughs> over curries into a few minutes here. There was one particularly interesting thing when VW took over um, Bentley through some v clever chicanery at the time, actually. And of course, you found yourself in a very interesting uh, meeting with Ferdinand Pierk when he uh, came to visit Crew after uh, VW Audi acquiring Crew, I use the term loosely. Um, and he, of course, uh, was a huge force of nature in the car world. He was Dr. Porsche's grandson, and uh, he was instrumental in the development of the early Porsche 911 the Audi Quattro, the Bugatti Veyron, Porsche 917 that obliterated uh, the competition at Le Mans, a uh, massively clever and gifted engineer. Fair to say an automotive genius, I would say? Oh, Probably. I think so. He, he oversaw Bugatti, Lamborghini, acquisition mm -hmm. of all these brands and built VW into the global empire it is now. But, um, and you were in the meeting, weren't you, when he came sure. to... To visit. So this is a, a Saturday morning, days after it had become public knowledge that the fight, and it, it did appear to be a fight for Rolls-Royce and Bentley Motors, VW had been successful in winning that fight. And my recollection of that, two things. First of all, bearing in mind that Serif and Arnage, when you look at the underpinnings, there is a substantial amount of BMW Yes. We'd had a long, probably 10, 12 year partnership by then with BMW to give um, Rolls-Royce and Bentley access to things like air conditioning systems, suspension systems, uh, gearboxes and engines and all those kinds of things. The presupposition always seemed to be with BMW, well of course we will, come the day, we will acquire um, uh, Rolls-Royce and Bentley cars. They got this... Um, uh, this close partnership um, with the car side through the joint development of a jet aero engine um, uh -huh. at the time. And it was advantageous to crew to take the opportunity of rummaging through the parts box, frankly, from an engineering point of view. 
Two things came out of that Saturday morning meeting for me. One was that a number of us wanted to understand what Pierre's view of, frankly, what Pierre thought he'd bought. Because a number of us knew perfectly well what the Rolls-Royce brand was from a crew point of view. We used to pay, there was a silly piece of negotiation every year to pay a penny, I think it was, for the use of the Rolls-Royce trademarks. And this is what went back to the 1971 rescue of RB211 engines, was it, yeah. at the time, by the government. Crew really didn't have the Rolls-Royce other than permission to use the Rolls-Royce brand. And it, it was, I think it was clear to us in that meeting on the Saturday morning that Pierre thought they had bought Rolls-Royce and Bentley. And we tried to be as delicately oh. clear as possible. <laughs> Bear in mind that this is a guy that's pretty firm in his views, shall we say, Dr. Pierre, that we, he probably hadn't bought Rolls-Royce. Awkward, um, awkward. Awkward, absolutely. Um, but there is a point at which you don't press your point, um, especially seeing as you hope to be employed. Um, so we left that to one side. <laughs> and then there was this glorious conversation about these cars. Um, I've got um, uh, BMW engines in, or we don't want BMW engines in, and one, one could quite understand that. At the time, we were making cars for the Sultan of Brunei. And somehow or another, um, and he, he did have an extremely uh, efficient grapevine, somebody told him that we were building Arnage with the then old Rolls-Royce and Bentley V8. And that, in fact, the um, Sultan of Brunei wouldn't have BMW engines, he would have... So we shoehorned cut, shot, mm. eased, hammered the old um, V8 into our NAR shells. And um, from my point of view, what he then said wasn't a problem. But you could watch the blood drain out of the engineer's heads because he said, good, well, in 12 months' time, our NAR will have the Bentley V8 engine in it, gentlemen. And you could hear a pin drop in the room. <laughs> like, how on earth are we supposed to engineer that? Because cars for Brunei were made, it's a bit like we started, were made in this thoroughly craft way. Yes. This was a car put in the middle of a craft workshop to make one or two that would take six or 12 months to engineer right. it. Yeah. And here was Dr. Pierre announcing to the engineers who had nothing to do with these Brunei cars. These were hand built with uh, incredibly yes. skilled people announcing that they would do this. It was viewed as a horrendous task. If only of things like weight, because the old V8s were a heavy engine, whereas the BMW were light. Oh, of course. Yes. And, you know, the, the, the reworking of suspension systems and all the electronics. Um, it's once you've built an integrated car, integrated around BMW electronics, he was Pick announcing that we were about to sort of wind the clock back a dec or de <laughs> decade or three and you can just do this, can't you? Yeah. It probably says something for the cautious minds in crew that, of course, we achieved that and the yeah. uh, Arnage was launched 12 months later to great fanfare with yes. the uh, old V8 in it. Yeah, and that was the red label, I seem to That remember. was the red label, yeah. It started yes, off as, and then it became the T, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, it did. But it's it's so it's this is typically British, isn't it? This is quintessential. Mm -hmm. This is utterly British. Um, it's the absolute opposite end of the spectrum. You know, walking around the factory asking anybody if they've got a set of door <laughs> handles hanging around in their toolbox. I mean, Mercedes, it would be itemised on a picking list somewhere, something. even if it was handwritten carefully in a book or yeah. something, uh, going back to the 1970s. It just creates mental images of sort of, you know. Chaos, really. But, uh, and, and this is why I was suggesting that you love German cars. 
have a, a sort of love-hate relationship with Italian and can't make your mind up over Bridget <laughs> Cars. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because what's true of Rolls-Royce and Bentley will have been true of Aston Martin, but Aston Martin will have been as craft and as chaotic in every sense as Rolls and Bentley because they made yes. even fewer cars. Yes, um, exactly. And people don't understand this. They, I've had many a conversation stroke argument with people over the years where, well, of course... Um, you're only making three or four a week. Anybody can make three or four a week. Oh, can you indeed? <laughs> um, well, I'd, let me tell you, having made 10,000 engines a week, making 10,000 engines a, is a piece of doddle in comparison with making mm. two or three. Everything, everything that um, uh, goes into a production process is made simpler by the larger volume you make. Making tiny volumes is a nightmare. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your um, your insight. <laughs> um, I can feel another curry coming on in the future. <laughs> right. um, we'll uh, we'll have a debriefing session about this video. And uh, um, but um, yeah, thanks very much for coming over. Okay. Pleasure. Pete, and uh, you know, um, I think we both appreciate these uh, YouTube videos. I certainly do. Well done, you. Uh, it's lovely to be part of one. Oh, thank, thank you, you very much indeed. Okay. That's. Um, Right, well, we'd better get on with, uh, with testing this car now and giving it a run and uh, looking at a couple of other things that made the Camargue special. Now then, I'll just look at another interesting aspect of this car. We'll take the rather large air filter housing off. Now then, 007. Um, normally, uh, Rolls-Royce used twin SU carburettors, which they did for many, many years, going right back to the 1940s. Um, and they had a sort of diameter of that sort of size, very small. And what happened in the 1970s was, like every other car manufacturer, they were fighting emissions laws, ever tightening emissions laws on the amount of hydrocarbons and carbon monoxide that an engine could throw out the tailpipe. And Rolls-Royce had to detune their engines the same as anybody else did. They went from six and a quarter litre, 6230cc in 1970 up to 6, 750, simply to compensate for loss of power. And they lowered the compression ratio from 9.1 to 8 to 1, I mean, all sorts of different things. And then they started to bring out some trick solutions to the loss of power to restore things. And after all, if you're paying £32,000 or almost twice the price of an equivalent Rolls-Royce, it has to have at least that car's performance, really, the, 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 uh, the cheaper uh, car's performance. So one of the things Rolls-Royce did was put this, this baby on, which is called a Solex 4A1 carburettor. And this is a fairly complex piece of equipment. It's got uh, this choke here the two tiny chokes, and then when, when the amount of air going into the engine allows, it opens up these, which are called vacuum secondaries. Um, and you get the, the sum total of all these four chokes worth of air going into the engine. And it actually made quite a difference to the performance of this engine. It, it increased it by at least 10%, just that one thing. But the funny part about this is, in terms of volume of air going through the engine, remember this engine is six and a three quarter liters. This carburetor, the Solex 401A1, was used on a BMW 320 and 520 cars. They were a two liter engine. And this was supposedly the high performance variant on a two liter engine. And here it is on a six and three quarter liter engine as the upgrade. I mean, crazy really. But the reason for this is that it was an improvement over the twin SU carburettors. But interesting that Rolls-Royce uh, should use a, a carburettor off a two litre car to upgrade its six and three quarter litre engine. Um, it still doesn't develop quite as much power as the, uh, the vehicle we can hear in the background, but it was certainly an improvement and yeah, it made a difference on the road. So. Um, yeah, upgrade to a two-litre carburettor. That's Rolls-Royce's idea of um, trick uh, modding at the time. Well, as I mentioned earlier, one of the, the joys of this is this wonderful dashboard. And uh, I just think it's a fabulous place to be. There's, there is a real sense of occasion. One of the things with classic cars um, 
It doesn't matter whether it's a, a, a Mini, which in itself are very difficult to find now uh, for, for hardly any money at all. They're all suddenly worth something. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's a multi-million pound Ferrari or whether it's um, this car, which isn't worth much more than a fantastic Silver Shadow, really, or what it is. It's about the sense of occasion. Do you? Is it a sensory experience driving a classic car and being in it? And the answer in this case is yes, it's fabulous. This dashboard, um, this wonderfully comfortable seat with the, uh, the, the special Connolly Newella leather, um, the, the flying lady, uh, the spirit of ecstasy being in front of you, uh, and actually the, the lovely direct steering, because it is direct. Um, this is a 1980 car, so it's got the rack and pinion steering, which uh, came out with the Shadow 2. And it's just a wonderful place to be. Um, I, can, I can throw this car around, negligible body roll, um, and it's uh, that V8, just quietly, that all aluminium V8, quietly burbling away in the background with that Solex 4A1 carburetor on the top. And there is a real sense of occasion. Uh, it's got the split level air conditioning, which is working beautifully. Uh, and I'm sat here in my uh, cosseted, imperious <laughs> cabin. Um, not quite sure what everybody else around me thinks, but I'm enjoying myself. Um, and uh, it's just a great place to be. And as I said earlier, one of the beauties of this car is you can punt it round. I mean, I'm taking this corner in a reasonably spirited fashion, no, no pun intended, and um, it, it just hunkers down and goes. Quite incredible. It's never going to be a Ferrari, but considering it's a two and a quarter ton, hand-built, 40-year-old car, this thing can hustle, and that is one of the absolute delights of the Camargue. Um, in answer to the question, does this feel truly special compared to other Rolls Royces? Yes, it does. Um, I remember uh, when this first came out on BBC Radio 2, the national uh, radio station in the UK, uh, Gloria Honeyford, who did the lunchtime programme, actually drove one of these at, at, at its launch in 1975. And I could tell, reading between the lines, she was very intimidated and very nervous about the whole thing, but it really is very easy to drive. Um, it's, uh, the body control is good, it's not wallowing round, it's not um, bouncing around, it's not got any of that roly-poly Rolls-Royce feel, and yet, as I say, it does handle. There's a, a particular favourite bend coming up in the road here, and I will just knock this lovely um, automatic transmission selector down to woo uh, to two and just hustle it a bit through the bends through this corner and um, yeah it just stays beautifully stable and beautifully um, poised there it is that was foot foot to the metal okay it's hardly um, the most uh, powerful engine in the world but nevertheless uh, with the Solex carburetor on it, it's about 220-230 uh, brake horsepower, but obviously a lot of torque. Uh, that's the beauty of this engine. And the slightest uh, movement of the steering wheel is all it takes to... Uh, there's no free play in the steering. I just do that, and there it is. It's moving. It's, uh, it's, it's quite an undemanding car to drive, but uh, you've got this lovely fold-out armrest in the driver's seat, uh, which just sits at exactly the right height for you to be able to rest, but also have full control of the car. Um, I, I've always liked Camargues uh, since the first time I drove one, because they just drive really far better than they ought to. It's as simple as that. One of the things I've touched on when I have had visits from um, Dr. Eichhorn or Dr. Pefkin. One of the things we, we've discussed is the word waftability. Um, and basically that was their English word to sum up the Bentley experience of 
uh, sort of just w riding on a wave of torque, wafting along. Now, of course, in the turbocharged cars, that takes on a whole new dimension. But even in this, there is that, that waftability, that, um, that sense of far more power than there actually is from the engine. And um, just being able to, to waft along on a, on a wave of torque. Um, and this uh, General Motors Turbo Hydromatic uh, 400, the GM400 transmission, of its time in the 1970s was almost certainly the smoothest automatic transmission uh, it was possible to come across um, and it really is it does just waft along this this car um, I'm gonna pull out to overtake this cyclist and well that was a little more than wafting <laughs> but um, you get the idea that was the uh, that all four chokes of that Solex 4A1 four choke carburetor kicking in there um, and um, interestingly uh, refinement has always been the byword for Rolls Royce at the risk of stating the obvious and one of the overriding concerns with any engine they've developed is the noise or lack of it and even though this has got a fairly big throat, this, this carburetor, it's got four very hungry throats waiting to gobble up a load of air and petrol. Uh, they've actually made the air filter out of sufficiently thick material that you can't uh, hear too much induction roar. So if I just... It's there, but it's not overriding your sense of sort of calm in the cabin, really. And this was about as far as Rolls-Royce were prepared to push it at this time. Until, of course, the Bentley brand took the, uh, the leap it did in 1982 and Rolls-Royce and Bentley's world irreversibly changed when the Mulsan Turbo came out. And the, the funny thing about that was it was actually developed around the time of, uh, of this car being contemporary. Um, the, the story of uh, how the Bentley Turbo came about is for another day and another video, but it was very much around the mid-70s uh, that that was uh, developed. So, yeah. Um, but that all comes back full circle to the, the waftability that, uh, that sort of feeling of, of power uh, in, in the car. And uh, for anybody who was parting with their £32,000 in 1975 onwards, uh, for those 531 people, this is what it's all about. That imperious, uh, commanding feeling which is very un PC these days but we don't buy a classic car to be conventional we buy a classic car for fun and uh, edification and in that respect this delivers it in spadefuls in raw terms of smiles per mile is this car a winner absolutely it is it represents a very interesting uh, time in in Rolls-Royce history. It was the most expensive production car in the world. It still reeks of quality in a way. Um, yeah, it needs some work. It's a fixer-upper, this car, but what a lovely place to be. Really, really like this car. Rolls-Royce's philosophy, and I include Bentley in that at the time, was to make everything as light and as effortless to work as possible. And that even came down to the gear range selector, which, I mean, a lot of American cars, whether they be Ford, Chrysler or GM, all of them had a standard sort of method of automatic gear range selection, which was to have park at the top and then a cable operated or mechanical mechanism for reverse neutral drive. And it was standard in all US cars. Because Rolls-Royce was such a big market in the US, Rolls-Royce came up with this very clever electric gear range selector. So it works the same way, park, reverse, neutral drive, etc. But it's, it's just fingertip control because it controls an electric motor, um, which makes it incredibly uh, lovely to use, actually. It's just beautifully engineered, this mechanism. Um, and for the Camargue, they did something really strange. They put this bend in it here which actually, instead of it being up here like a conventional American automatic gear range selector of this era, and also a Rolls-Royce one, 
it's actually bent down so that it actually feels extra special. I know it sounds weird, but it does feel different and it does feel special. This is the level of detail that they went to. Incredible, really. Well, this car isn't in A1 perfect condition. Like a lot of hand-built cars, if they're not cosseted 100% of the time, they start to get a bit crusty at the seams. And this one's no exception. It's going to have a regime of restoration work done on it. But one thing that is still working perfectly and demonstrates the tactile delight of hand-built cars, um, and remember that this was the most expensive car in the world, is the door handle. This is the first thing that people engage with when they actually get in the car. And this piece of beautiful craftsmanship is exclusive to the Camargue. You can't do this with any other Rolls Royce, but I'm now going to use this little finger to open the door. How lovely is that? This is a huge door and all it needs is that to open it. Absolutely lovely piece of engineering and the sort of thing that just, you know, it's nerdy, it's hardly noticeable, but it's the sort of thing that just makes a big difference to, uh, to your experience with a car like this. Well, that concludes another Tyrrell's Classic Workshop video. Hope you've enjoyed it and uh, we will be back with something else, hopefully very soon.